thought I was loud enough, but I guess not. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Center for Global Health seminar series. Uh, this uh, series is um, meant to stimulate discussion uh, of ideas around global cancer research, and um, we uh, are hoping to invite a distinguished panel of speakers. Um, and as we can see, we already have um, a very uh, distinguished scientist in our midst today who's going to be talking. Uh, this is the second in our series. Uh, we started last month, and uh, thank you for attending. Um, I'd like to get uh, things started by introducing Dr. Lisa Stevens. Um, uh, Dr. Stevens is uh, the Deputy Director of Planning and Operations at the Center for Global Health at NCI. So welcome, everyone, and Lisa. Well, thank you, Suda. It's my distinct pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker today. Uh, but before he comes to the microphone, I'd like to say a few words about him and the Fogarty International Center. So the Center for Global Health is just one year old right now, and I have to say that I think one of our key partners in the standing up of this center has been the Fogarty International Center. Their cooperation and support has been vital to what we've been able to do over the year, and I think that speaks to Dr. Glass's leadership. So Dr. Glass has been the director of the Fogarty International Center since March of 2006, so he'll be coming up on his seventh anniversary very soon. And he asked me not to make the introduction too long, and I don't want to take away from his remarks, but I just want to highlight where he has continued to maintain field studies while running the Fogarty International Center. So he still maintains field studies in India, Bangladesh, Brazil, Mexico, Israel, Russia, Vietnam, and China, and it says, and elsewhere. So I'm not sure when he has time to sleep, but I do even more so appreciate the fact that he's given us his time today. So Dr. Glass, please come. He's asked that questions stay to the end, and just to remind you that all uh, presentation and questions will be recorded. So thank you, Dr. Glass. <coughs> Great. Lisa, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. You might, uh, my slides are here. A little help. Buttons are not, uh, yeah. got to get them going. Here they are. Okay. Right here. Yep, okay. okay. Got my blinders on. That's, it's not there. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, let me let me just start by first. I'm delighted to be at NCI and to have your Center for um, Global Health uh, started. It's been fun to watch this go, and I've worked with NCI since I got here. And I thought I'd give you a little bit of my background because, in fact, I think that global health and NCI uh, and cancer are, are really a part of my early formation and part of the reason I'm so excited to be here. I grew up in a small town in, in Somerville, New Jersey, right, right near Manville, which was the site of Johns Manville. And my father was an orthopedic surgeon, and his friends were all radiologists. And in the 1950s, they began seeing patients with chronic asbestosis and mesothelioma. It was a really rare and un, almost unknown disease in the United States, and yet here in the middle of New Jersey, in the middle of nowhere, if you will, small town, Local radiologists were picking up mesotheliomas, and the links to between mesothelioma and asbestosis exposure are, are now well known. And when I got interested in this in the School of Public Health, I began realizing that this asbestos came from South African mines and Canada, and this was really a global health problem. So my interest in global health really began as a, as a child in a small town in New Jersey being linked to a global cancer exposure. When I finished my internship, I then went to, uh, to Oxford, and I worked with Sir Richard Dahl, who was really the preeminent epidemiology of the 20th century and really preeminent in cancer. Uh, his book and his text on cancer in five continents was really the the 50-year-old version of the Cancer Genome Atlas and a lot of what's going on today because all that we had to distinguish the differences in the distribution of cancers was their, uh, their epidemiology and the fact that he had, uh, he had made these observations that you had lots of esophageal cancer in the Far East and hepatomas uh, and the like. The distributions were different and that led to the opportunity to understand uh, environmental influences as well as genetic influences. He also 
while we were there, uh, was doing, I just completed the 20 years of the doctor smoking study. You know, I, my parents smoked when I was growing up. They smoked camels because three out of four doctors recommended camels. They, you know, it's, uh, you had doctors in white coats recommending it. And uh, in 20 years, we had, you know, tremendous data on the importance of, of, of smoking and lung cancer. And, uh, when he made these observations, we said to him, Sir Richard, why don't you go out and do something about it? Why don't you talk to the Brits? It's the biggest risk factor for cancer. Why don't you have them reduce uh, uh, smoking in, in the U.K.? And he said, you know, Roger, he said, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist. I'm not someone in policy. And so why we don't do this. Uh, I mean, I've provided the evidence, and it's for the politicians. And if you look at this slide from Richard Pito, um, you can see that in the UK, cancer mortality has come down for lung cancer, taken 40 years and literally millions of deaths for that uh, smoking to decrease this much and, uh, and lung cancer to go away. 26 miles across the English Channel in France, people who had the same knowledge and data did nothing to deal with smoking. Uh, and here in France, lung smoke, uh, lung cancer after, uh, from the 1950s after the war went up in almost a mirror image to what happened in the UK. So there's some kind of a lesson here that while we do tremendous work in the epidemiology and understanding of these diseases and risks, the implementation of these recommendations is hard to introduce in many countries. I've been working for a long time in China. And, and now today in China, and Richard Pito has written about this a great deal, uh, the risk of, of smoking uh, and lung cancer and heart disease related to smoking is huge, and it's really the epidemic of the 21st century for China, the biggest, probably the biggest environmental risk there is today. And yet, despite the fact that we know so much about the links between smoking and lung cancer and heart disease and the rest, and the fact that one in three Chinese who smoke will die of their disease, we still have a pr problem. So I realize that, uh, that a lot of global health is not only in the basic research that we do, but in the implementation of the recommendations that come from that research. Well, when I was an undergraduate and how I got involved and interested in global health was that as an undergraduate, uh, I was in the history of science. And I thought about and I was introduced to this Broad Street pump the story of John Snow controlling cholera in the city of London. And this was really the beginning of descriptive epidemiology. It was also the, descript the beginning of global health because the quarantine services around the world were set up to prevent diseases like cholera from coming on our borders. So in reading this as an undergraduate, I was young and idealistic, and I said, well, if, if, if cholera is spread by bad water and by uh, taking handles off the Broad Street pump, Maybe I should go out in the world and take handles off pump or provide clean water and see if I could do something for cholera. And I ended up in Bangladesh, which is really the, the heartland of cholera in the world today for endemic cholera. I went out to the uh, community, and there were two wells being put in to prevent the spread of cholera uh, and to decrease the incidence. And uh, the tube wells, after a $100 million program to put tube wells throughout the field area, made absolutely no impact on the incidence of cholera in that area. How can it be that by providing clean water, microbiologically clean drinking water, you have no impact on cholera? And it really meant that while we understand some of the issues of cholera transmission, we really don't understand people's behavior and how they would drink from the tank waters and the river waters because the water was sweeter and, and um, was not contaminated. So with that, uh, I also learned that oral rehydration therapy, which was new at the time, could actually prevent the cholera deaths in the field. And uh, when people say, what's the value of investing in global health research for the American public, I always come back to this example because here, the U.S. spent about $10 million in research to learn how to prevent cholera deaths in patients who were severely ill. But in fact, that $10 million has come back to be used by every mother who has a child with acute diarrheal disease, which is almost all mothers. And the treatment for that is oral rehydration therapy, which is exactly the same treatment that was developed for prevention of deaths from cholera in Bangladesh. 
research in Bangladesh that led to a, a very common treatment for diarrheal diseases, the most common treatment in the United States today. So uh, I, I went on to learn that cholera wasn't the most common problem in Bangladesh, but rotavirus was, uh, a disease that hadn't been identified when I graduated from medical school. And so I spent really uh, 25 years, 30 years, working on rotavirus prevention through vaccines. We got new vaccines that were licensed in the U.S. They've been put into recommended for routine immunization of our children. If any of you had children born after 2006, they would have gotten this vaccine, or one of these vaccines. It's led to a 95% reduction in hospitalizations for rotavirus in the United States, which is huge. It's about a 5% decrease in hospitalizations of American children under five. It puts me in direct conflict with my wife, who's the chair of pediatrics at Emory. You know, her bottom line is how many kids come into the hospital. My bottom line is how many kids don't come in for diarrheal diseases, and so we have a, a active discussion about this. But also in developing countries, the same vaccine is led, and here in Mexico, you see deaths. The vaccine was introduced in 2007, and within two years, diarrheal deaths in Mexico, diarrheal deaths have gone down by 40% due to one vaccine for rotavirus. So I've seen amazing changes in global health in a vaccine that's been developed for both domestic and, local and global use come into practice. And we have global recommendations for use of the vaccine. Vaccines in about 38 countries today. And we have a lot of uh, agenda ahead of us for rotavirus. I give this example because, to me, I learned a bunch of issues about global health um, messaging that I think have carried forward for me at Fogarty. And when I was asked to lead the Fogarty Center, I was really an inch wide, uh, narrow, if you will, in my research interest on diarrheal disease and, um, uh, and, and very broad and uh, very narrow and, and uh, but very deep. Now I'm at Fogarty and I'm uh, a mile wide and about an inch deep, so it's a completely different mission. But what I did learn from this experience what I did learn was that if you start by training people early, I never thought I'd work on diarrheal disease or global health when I was graduating from medical school, but by getting people involved in research in the low or middle income country early in their careers, it could really have a lasting Im impact on their careers. Also, I, I learned that the simple interventions I thought about, like uh, prevention of smoking or like introducing tube wells and clean water, don't always have the impact that you expect. Uh, I learned that, that uh, unusual environments lead to unusual innovations, and the fact that you have oral rehydration therapy developed in Bangladesh but being widely used in the U.S. is clearly a benefit of global health research. I learned that these partnerships and global partnerships are absolutely essential, and I'm still working in Bangladesh. And I realized finally that you have to take science where the problems are and where their opportunities are. And I think that's really the lesson for all of us here at NIH. Well, when I got to NIH, I got to Fogarty, I, was, I arrived just when this document, the Disease Control Priority Project, landed on my desk. It was a project to uh, address, if you're a Minister of Health, and you have a million dollars, where should you spend a million dollars? What are your best buys for, for global health? And this was led not by a physician, not by a public health guru or an epidemiologist. It was led by an economist who said, what's, what's the best buy? Let's look at the, um, the value of our different interventions. He started with this, doc, this table, uh, sort of a classic table showing life expectancy in the 20th century uh, over time. And you can see that in each cohort, by age or by timing, our life expectancy has gotten longer despite, uh, despite income. And this is really due to lots of interventions and lots of uh, rural uh, electrification, behavior changes, technology. But the bottom line is that life expectancy, longevity, is the most important risk factor for cancer and is the most important risk factor for, for noncommunicable diseases and chronic diseases. So we have a, a lengthening, prolonged life expectancy throughout the world, and it's cr clearly critical. 
Take, for example, China, where I've been visiting since 1977. Life expectancy has grown from 39 years in 1960 to about 75 years today, uh, 2010. And it's, it's about seven and a half years of prolongation per decade. It's the longest prolongation of life, the largest prolongation of life in the history of mankind. And this means that their problems in the 21st century are going to be with non-communicable diseases and with cancer. So uh, this really changes the way we think about global health. And when we look around the world, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa, the prime causes of death are these non-communicable uh, disease issues, uh, cancer, heart disease, and the like. So global health in the, in the 21st century is going to be with this changing patterns of disease due to age, the idea that we share common problems and we need to have some common solutions, whether it's for cancer control or hypertension, uh, or smoking addiction or environmental hazards. We really need new solutions to the problems we have. We need to implement the lessons we know. We need to think about new technologies such as the use of mobile phones, uh, information and communication technology, and really some of the most novel solutions are from the bioengineers, from the lawyers who negotiated the Framework Convention for Tobacco Control, from business folks who know how to deliver drugs and vaccines to the most distant reaches, the same reaches where Coca-Cola can reach in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, I, when I got here, I went around and I talked to each of the IC directors about what they thought was important for global health. And, of course, I started with Tony Fauci because I'm from infectious disease background. And Tony gave me this lovely slide that, you know, the global health is really uh, infectious disease, tropical diseases, because we're never more than a plane ride uh, from an infectious disease outbreak. And it's obvious to all of us that this is so. Then I went to Francis Collins at the Genome Institute. Francis said, well, you know, uh, we're a melting plot uh, we're a melting pot in the United States of uh, people who come from all over the world. We've all brought our genes together. We've all mixed our genes here. It's very hard sometimes to decipher genes from a mixed pool. But if we go back to where these genes came from, we can actually uh, find the roots of disease and maybe their cures and, and uh, causes. So I only come to the perhaps the most important, uh, one of the most important diseases of our times and which a third of us, how many of you are over 50? A third of us who are over 50 will probably end up with Alzheimer's sometime in our later years. And uh, how are we going to find biomarkers for Alzheimer's? Where will we find treatments? Well, here's a, 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 um, an interesting area of global health where uh, the National Institute of Aging has gone out to Columbia to a family of people, uh, a woman who, who uh, moved from Europe to Colombia in 1745, the genetics, she brought with her an unusual mute, mutation for Alzheimer's that has a presentation of early onset in the 30s and rapid progression in five, five years or so. So that if we, there's a concentration of patients with Alzheimer's who are in their 40s and 50s, young, rapid progression, if we want to find biomarkers for this disease, this is where we can go. And in fact, now there are plans to bring some of these patients to the U.S. to look at biomarkers, to look at progression, and to try new Alzheimer's drugs. It's a really important way that we can get a, a hand up on advancing research in this critical disease. And it's where uh, a population in Colombia, because of, of aware investigators, unusual populations, provide extraordinary opportunities for us to work together to solve a common problem. And there are many examples of these. And I want to move on. I went to see uh, uh, NCI. And this was six years ago. And I said, what's the problem of global health for NCI? And my comment was, well, 80 to 85 percent of the cancers in the world today are going to be in low, uh, lower middle income countries. And many of these are, are diseases just like Richard Dahl identified that are unusual. Where are we going to find enough hepatomas to understand uh, the genetics of hepatomas? Where will we find esophageal cancers except in places like Iran, uh, where they have unique populations and exposures? 
Uh, the red band is the band of, uh, of um, Burkitt's lymphoma. And if we want to understand Burkitt's lymphoma, uh, this is where we have to go. So this is really a global problem, and we can find, we can clearly understand the geographic distribution. You, you may or may not know of Dennis Burkett, <clears throat> a, a British surgeon who in the 60s went off to, uh, to Uganda, the Malago Center, the same center that uh, Dr. Varma's visited last year uh, and where Larry Corey has been working for about a decade. Dennis Burkett found these, these children like this with a big jaw full of lymphoma. He'd never seen this before. He was un uncomfortable that, Bur that this African lymphoma took on the name of Burkitt's lymphoma. But at the time, EB virus had just been discovered by Epstein and Barr, and they didn't know what diseases it caused. And Burkitt made this association in a scientific meeting with these investigators, found that EB, <coughs> EB virus was associated with Burkitt's, and that was really the, one of the earliest demonstrations in humans that a virus was the etiologic agent of cancer, okay? So uh, if we're thinking about the importance of this observation, this scientific breakthrough in knowledge, it didn't come from the U.S. or the English or whatever. It came from observations made on populations in Uganda. He then went to Sloan Kettering, Burkett did, when they were beginning the first trials with anti-cancer uh, uh, drugs and brought back some, some of the first chemotherapeutic agents, gave them, he put them in his pocket. This is the IRB of the time. I gave them to patients, and in two weeks, this child's lymphoma went away. First demonstration of early encouragement that treatment of cancer could be effective. Another discovery, an advance of knowledge, not made in downtown New York or downtown Europe, but in Malago Hospital. So if we're going to find new cures for disease and populations that are unusual, uh, this may be where we have to go. It's clearly obvious for diseases like malaria, but for something like, like uh, Burkitt's lymphoma, if we want novel, novel solutions to these problems, this is where we'll find them. And the other example, I just mentioned this one because it takes me back to asbestos. Here's a group in Cappadocia uh, where, in, uh, where they um, build their houses with asbestos bricks. And so, and they've been doing this for only a thousand years, and they have the highest incidence of mesotheliomas. So the molecular understanding of mesothelin, uh, the epidemiology, biomarkers, and treatment will probably come not from studies in the U.S., but from studies in places like this where the incidence of the disease is so high and the uh, treatment is, uh, is so uh, sorely needed. And uh, there's also the genetics that now can be worked out, something that wouldn't have been done uh, locally but can be done through international uh, collaborations, and the risk factors for mesothel mesotheliomas in this particular community through international collaboration. And finally, on our board, and I think on the NCI board as well, Fumi Olapade, who's who, uh, a Nigerian woman oncologist now working in Chicago, the University of Chicago, who, who came to inner city Chicago, found African American women who presented with their breast cancer, really fulminant breast cancer, late. When she put them on treatment, they didn't respond as American women did, as as white American women did, and she said. And many of the physicians said, oh, this is just because of access problems, health equity. These women just don't get access until their disease is fulminant. They haven't been screened. And when you give them treatment, they don't take it. And Fumi said, no, that's not so. And she looked at the genomics, and she found that these African, the women that she saw in Nigeria who were just like the African-American women had uh, were triple negatives for markers of cancer. And so the genetic basis of, of understanding the genetics of breast cancer coming from an African woman looking at an African American and a Caucasian U.S. population to shake us in our understanding that African American women have to be screened differently and treated differently for their cancers. It's sort of a vital, a vital uh, observation made by an African, Amer an African in our own setting. Reverse technology, if you will. 
And of course, there are lots of environmental disasters that we know of. So the really global health has gone in the 20th century from being a, a problem of infectious diseases, tropical diseases, diseases that know no borders, to really the full uh, diversity of diseases that come with aging, with exposure, with genetics, uh, and, the, and behaviors uh, that are changing. So the frontiers of biomedical research in the 21st century may really lie in the global uh, arena. They're unusual diseases, but they're diseases that we have here in the United States as well. There are unusual exposures, like the exposures to asbestos, the exposures to smoking, exposures that we're not completely sure of that may cause some of these other uh, diseases. Unusual populations. I was just with uh, this morning with the NHLBI Centers of Excellence program, and the woman from China said, you know, we haven't presented, but we're working on the largest salt intervention trial uh, in the world. And I said, I said, why are you doing this in China? What's the problem? You know, what? He says, well, first, stroke is very important. The number one cause of death in China is stroke. He says, second, you have a salt problem here as well, but all of the salt that we have is in formulated foods, prepared foods. In China, every mother makes her own food and puts in salt. And if we give them low-sodium salt, we can actually change uh, consumption of salt, and we hope outcomes in terms of disease. So this is something we can do in China with larger numbers and with greater compliance than you could ever begin to think of doing in the United States. And if we can show that this really works, we'll have a, a, a basis to reduce salt exposures in our own foods. A very uh, uh, nice observation. Extraordinary partnerships that we have. When I was at CDC, the issue of folate and neural tube defects was right uh, on the front burner. They went to China, the CDC group went to China to work with the Chinese on a folate supplementation uh, experiment, an experiment with a half a million pregnant women. We would never find that here to demonstrate that folate for the prevention of neural tube defects could have a massive impact and was a, was a global remedy, if you will. And really smart people and good partnerships. So there are really unusual opportunities that we see throughout the global, uh, uh, our global partnerships. And this is exactly what uh, NCI is doing through your Center for Global Health. Well, coming to the Fogarty mission, our Fogarty mission is to uh, address global health challenges through innovative and collaborative programs for research and training. Now, we're about the smallest center on the NIH campus of the 27. So what can we do to help a giant uh, like NCI promote your global health agenda? And I want to speak to this in my, in my final moments. Of course, you know, we, we help all of the ICs, but I'm here with NCI. We have a portfolio of programs. I call it an alphabet soup because you know about D43s and ATRIPS and AIDS trainings and emerging infectious diseases. But, but what comes out of this and what Fogarty does extremely well are setting up collaborative research um, initiatives between U.S. and foreign sites in training U.S. investigators to work comfortably in low-income settings, just like I started out in Bangladesh and I'm still working there, to have foreign fellows come and train or be part of training programs uh, with U.S. investigators and developing the institutional capacity through our programs in ethics, in research management, in informatics that allows uh, international collaboration to occur by other institutes and centers at NIH. Well, when, when we began our global health programs, 1988, AIDS was a disease of the four H's, hemophiliacs, heroin addiction, Haitians, and homosexuals, the four H's. But it wasn't a problem of death in sub-Saharan Africa in 1988. So we began our first uh, AIDS programs, programs in AIDS, by bringing and training a, a, a uh, several dozen young investigators from low and middle income countries to come to work in the states to learn about HIV treatment, control, laboratory diagnosis, and to go back home and continue these partnerships with their U.S. institution. 
This was 25 years ago. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary. These characters here who were babies 25 years ago, young fellows in infectious disease, are now among the leaders of research in the world today in HIV. And almost every major innovation in drug treatment, in microbicide trials, in circumcision, in the prevention of vertical uh, transmission of HIVs, almost all of these have had a PI who's on this uh, scale or came out of the ATRIP program. Beyond that, they've each trained literally thousands of young investigators along the way. So that in the microbicide trial that was published a year ago, there were six trainees who were co-authors on the trial. It's not just that they've learned themselves, but they've continued. They're really just an extension of the NIH research network in the field, comfortable in working with their own populations, understanding of our ethical rules and guidelines, able to handle financing of NIH grants and global grants, and many of them have has sustained their activities and their research through partnerships with Welcome, through other governments, uh, through getting the national governments involved. It's been an absolute game changer for uh, for the AIDS community. Uh, we'd like to see that happen for cancer. We'd like to see it happen for heart, lung, and blood diseases, diabetes, addictions. And so this has been our working model, and it's worked very well. Well, when I came here, I said, who are the leaders of global health today in the world? And I went around and I looked at many of my contemporaries, and I said, this is an interesting picture, isn't it? I said, first of all, they're all old white men, okay? Second, they're all, except for Alan Rosenfeld, involved in infectious diseases. But they've all had one thing in common. They've all had this early childhood experience. They've all gone overseas for training and research early in their career, and that training globally has stuck with them and kept them in global health for a career and, and, and helped them. So who are going to be the leaders in the 21st century when the infectious diseases uh, are, are still with us, but other diseases, the NCDs, need to be with us? Well, we've had a signature program with the uh, Fogarty Fellows and Scholars. Uh, this has been expanded in the, in the uh, just this past year so that people in uh, 20 universities are involved. We'll send about uh, 80 fellows and scholars back and forth for training in the next year. And they're going to be trained in all areas and matters of, of clinical medicine and public health. They're mostly from T32 programs, the U.S. fellows. They're from existing U.S. institutions to go overseas to develop a, a research partnership, to develop a database for which they can apply for NIH grants, and they can come back and hopefully build these relationships uh, in the future. This morning I was at the NCI um, uh, meeting of centers of excellence. Jerry Bloomfield was there, one of our first, I think our first cardiologist of two. Both of those cardiologists, one went to India, one went to Kenya, they both had an incredible experience. They both come back to get K awards from NHLBI, and they both are now sending the next generation of fellows in their programs out to their former sites to build those partnerships. They've also been involved in training the foreign sites, investigators at the foreign sites, to do quality research. So this is a, a two-year-old, three-year-old program, but we think that in five years or ten years, we will have that next generation of researchers. Um, and uh, so the future leaders are really hopefully going to be not only men but women, not only in the infectious diseases, but in all areas of biomedical research, and we hope that these people will be the game changers of the future. Just as a simple example for cancer, this young woman, Krista Failander, came to us as a medical student 2006 and one of our early grantees. She didn't know where she was going in medical school or what she wanted to do, but we sent her to Zambia to work uh, on, on HPV, on, on the uh, looking for screening for papillomavirus. She set up in a, in a HIV clinic that was involved in vertical transmission, so pregnant women came in. Uh, she took that clinic space and she set up to do um, acetic acid staining and, and uh, visualization to identify cervical cancer lesions and to test for HIV. 
and she began that. She figured out how to do it. She started training uh, young nurses and using a cell phone to capture the image of the cervix to have it reviewed by an obstetrician or gynecologist. After six months, she was, she was halfway done with her project. She decided to stay for another year. And now this program is ongoing in a half a dozen countries. In the first year and a half, they screened 50,000 women, picked up all numbers of cancers in HIV-positive women, and that went right back into the program. And so now she's in a program in uh, OBGYN oncology. She plans to go back and work in Africa on HPV. She might well come to NCI for future help and support. Uh, we also have introduced and to expand our budget in, in these difficult flatline budget times, we've expanded our program with, with the Fulbright program. I was a Fulbrighter early in my career, and Fulbright for 30 years has not put an emphasis on, on public health or biomedical research. We now have the Fulbright Fogarty program for medical students and for postdocs to go and spend a year in a lower middle income country, and that's announced on our, our website. We have the MEPI program that's been supported by PEPFAR and uh, NIH, where NCI is one of the collaborators on a linked award. This is our effort over the next five years to build up African medical institutions, not only to work on HIV, but to work on basic medical education to improve the workforce, workforce capacity for a, for a diversity of diseases, including cancer. So this is another way that we have platforms where uh, introduction of cancer-related issues into the training program would be absolutely critical, would be good places to work. Another area of division of, of FODI is the Division of International Relations, where we've developed and we've been working with uh, Dr. Collins and with many of the ICs to build up what we call partnerships of research. You know, we do have this flatline budget. We're trying to figure out how to extend both opportunities and financing. And with the BRICS countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, but some other countries like South Korea, Turkey, um, the MENA regions, the Middle Eastern and Gulf states, uh, there are opportunities for co-funding. Uh, NCI has been on the cutting edge of co-funding in, uh, in China through the NSF in China with the aid OAR and with NIAID and now with NINDS. So we have opportunities to co-fund grants with the Chinese, with the Indians, so that they pay their part of the research and they see value in this relationship. Uh, it's extended in Brazil where Brazilian postdocs, are there any Brazilians here? Well, Brazilian postdocs who are on the NIH campus can now receive half of their stipend from the uh, National Research Council of Brazil. So if you want to hire postdocs, uh, Brazilians are, are, are willing and interested in coming to the U.S., and they're partially funded by the Brazilian government. A nice investment for Brazil in the scientific and knowledge base of their future. Uh, and also uh, in uh, other opportunities in India, we have the same same activities. The global the Cancer Genome Atlas is an opportunity to work in uh, around the world to think about the genetics of disease. And NCI and NHGRI have been key. But these relations with India, we've expanded greatly uh, during my tenure. Here I am. Uh, here we are in a visit with uh, the Secretary Sibelius at the Tata Memorial Institute. If you notice the man next to, next to her and on the bottom is speaking. He was a smoker and an industrialist in India. Uh, he smoked so long that he ended up with esophageal or tracheal cancer, and he has a wind tube. So he's talking, he's covering himself so he can breathe through his vocal cords. And, and they've developed advocacy programs for esophageal, oral cancers, not from smoking, but from chewing tobacco and from re tobacco-related disease. So they're really uh, outstanding investigators, huge patient populations. They're thinking through systems to let care and treatment go out from Tata around India. They're novel models for the l delivery of cancer care, and I think we'll see these in other countries as well. Low, uh, low cost cancer treatment delivered on a widespread basis and with novel opportunities for basic research and, and 
research on implementation. And of course, in China, uh, several years back, we had the 30-year anniversary of the first contact between uh, between the U.S. government, NIH, and China, and NCI was on the forefront of that. So you have a long history of training Chinese investigators who are now leaders. It's now an opportunity to change these relationships to true partnerships since China has really come of age in science. The other areas that, that Fogarty has been involved in, such as this, this cook stove initiative that Francis Collins has become involved with. NCI has done some lovely work on cancer from indoor air pollution. The, the concentration of pollutants in that fire that this woman is tending is about a hundred uh, to a thousand fold higher than air pollution levels in the community. And if she's in that home for several hours a day, her exposures to indoor air pollution far swamp any exposure she would have outside. So the opportunity to think about this cook stove alliance and how we will get the evidence uh, for clean cook stoves is going to be key. The global program from the UN uh, Foundation and the Cook Stove Alliance wants to put 100 million cook stoves in the world by 2020. I scratch my head as an epidemiologist like I scratch my head with the tube wells in Bangladesh. Will those tube wells stop cholera? They didn't. Will cook stoves stop the indoor air pollution problem? What do we need to make that research work? Because it's a very complicated intervention. Not only to have nice cook stoves that are clean, to have women accept cook stoves that work in their environment and for their uh, culture, to have indoor levels of air pollution be reduced low enough so that you have an impact, and to be able to actually monitor exposures in the short term and monitor impact in the long term. For diseases which have a short incubation period, like low birth weight in infants and ARIs, acute respiratory infections in children, to long-term exposures like cancer, heart disease, and chronic obstructive lung disease. So here's an initiative that, would, that will really could have, be a game changer in lower middle income countries. Three billion people use indoor fuels and cookstoves. Can we make a difference in health uh, through this uh, intervention? There's an estimated to be about two million deaths a year from indoor air pollution. I don't know where that figure comes from except from WHO. Whether we can impact it uh, is really the question and how we do this effectively. Uh, clearly a research agenda. And finally, just the mobile health. You know, we're having this mobile health symposium uh, downtown in December. And uh, this has been an area where four years ago we, we had 150 people on campus for a mobile health symposium. We didn't know who would come. Last year there were 3,500 people. The innovation in this space that could serve both NCI and all of NIH around chemical sensors of indoor air pollution, as an example, to do, to do uh, microscopy. You could diagnose with this Lucas microscope that we uh, have funded through Fogarty, you could diagnose leukemia, sickle cell disease, uh, make all kinds of CD4 counts uh, in, uh, in patients in the field, all with a cell phone and a small device as a microscope. You can do cellular analyses, uh, I, I, ideal for cancer biomarkers. Uh, Rebecca Richards Corden, who's on our board, has used a fiber optic scope hooked up to a cell phone to do colposcopy and to look at cervical lesions and to look at the nuclear density in the cervical tissue and the cervical lesion to detect cancer uh, by a nuclear density as opposed to an antigen or another uh, other method in clinical trials now and funded in part also by USAID. Adherence to treatment, clearly important through all of our NIH um, activities, whether it's for cancer chemotherapy, tuberculosis treatment, treatment for hypertension, treatment for tuberculosis. Uh, monitoring adherence through cell phone devices would be another way to identify people who are adherent. So Fogarty is, pr provides uh, really the watering pot to bring us together on a bunch of these global health issues. In closing, I have to tell you, I've become an astrologer. And I've become an astrologer because I've seen a, in this administration a lot of commitment to science and innovation at all levels. I've seen Francis Collins come on board as a champion of global health. We've seen the growth on university campuses of tremendous enthusiasm for global health 
activities. Well, so many students really want to go out overseas to do something in the global health arena. We've got all kinds of global partnerships that have occurred and unique opportunities uh, for advancing overseas. The G8, GAVI, the Global Fund for HIV, TB, and Malaria. Funding has been enormous. Here's the funding that's come into global health over the last, uh, last two decades. It's been enormous despite the problems in the world today. When I came, we started and we re had the IOM review, America's uh, vital interest in global health. Harold led this before he was NCI chief, and he led the, these uh, recommendations. These recommendations have been the guidelines for this administration and will hopefully be with us for years to come. They're clearly prescient of where we might be going. We've seen Francis Collins, of course, number four is expanding research and diseases affecting the developing world. And Francis is interesting. Why? I think in part because as a young physician, he went to Nigeria, he saw patients who had unusual presentations of diabetes and got interested in this issue and found the first genes for diabetes from these populations. So clearly good science leading that's of global interest. How can FIC partner with NCI to support your research in global cancer? A couple things. One is I think that the future of your global health initiative will be in your ability to train the next generation of investigators in all branches of cancer diagnostic, treatment, prevention, epidemiology, di uh, diagnostics, and the like, to think and work comfortably in low- and middle-income countries where opportunities abound and to train people from low- and middle-income countries to be your true partners in this uh, extension of research. The second is through our International Relations Division to build these partnerships and to expand them with other countries that see research in biomedical science as a priority. India, China, Brazil, Russia, Turkey, South Korea, Thailand, Mexico, and the like. They're really wonderful partners. They have money to invest in research. They need leadership, and they need know-how, and they need access to, uh, to knowledge and people. And finally, by linking you at NCI with other platforms on the NIH campus that you might not be aware of, for us at Fogarty, it's the MEPI program, these uh, 13 institutions in sub-Saharan Africa that are really in leadership positions uh, to help you. But with NICHD, they're their global health sites for early cancers in childhood. NHLBI has its 11 centers of excellence in low- and middle-income countries. NIAID has its vaccine sites where you might want to think about clinical trials. There are lots of opportunities, and through the Global Health Working Group, we're trying to bring you all together. So that's, that's the end of my presentation. I'm really delighted to be here. I think NCI has wonderful opportunities under Harold's leadership and with Ted in the driver's seat for this Center for Global Health. There's so many areas of cancer that are, uh, are amenable to global health research and intervention and change, and I think that's what we all hope will happen over the next decade. Thanks so much.